to turn the time over to our and they're going to introduce themselves, and then we're going to have you introduce yourselves, and we'll get started. So, judges, it's your turn. Good afternoon. I'm Rita McCannon. I'm an attorney in Huntsville, Alabama, and my colleagues are... Tim Moore from the University of Wisconsin at Madison. Jack Marlowe from Juniata College in Pennsylvania. Tell us about yourselves and your teacher, please. Good afternoon. My name is Jeffrey Surgeon, and we are representing East Hampton, Massachusetts. Good afternoon. I'm Amelia Fiorice, and we are all juniors at East Hampton High School. Good afternoon. I'm Jack Walter Timmy, and this is our teacher, Ms. Kelly Brown. Good afternoon. Okay. Okay. Um, we are all unit two, and we have chosen question two. So we will read that question to you while you're getting prepared. And We'll get going, okay? When explaining why the proposed constitution lacked a bill of rights, one federalist claimed that in a government possessed of enumerated powers, such a measure would be not only unnecessary, but preposterous and dangerous. Do you agree or disagree with this statement? Why or why not? In your opinion, did the first 10 amendments to the Constitution sufficiently address the concerns of the anti-federalists? To what extent, if any, should we consider adding additional amendments to our Constitution? We look forward to hearing from you and you may begin. In the ratification debates in Pennsylvania, James Wilson was asked to explain why the convention failed to add a Bill of Rights to the Constitution. He argued that the national government was limited by enumerated powers, giving no permission for said government to violate the rights of the people. To enumerate rights was to risk missing important ones, and therefore implying that their government had the right to violate them. Alexander Hamilton attempted to bolster this defense in Federalist 84 by arguing that certain rights were written within the Constitution, such as the right to habeas corpus in Article 1, Section 9, and the right to a trial by jury in criminal cases in Article 3. Hamilton pointed to states like New York, where rights were built into the Constitution instead of being listed in an entirely separate document. We believe the addition of a Bill of Rights was by no means preposterous and dangerous. Given what the text of the Constitution allowed, opposed to the idealized versions the Federalists presented. A Bill of, Rights, Bill of Rights was to assure the people that the government was limited due to the implied powers held within the Constitution. More specifically, Article 1, Section 8, Clauses 1, 3, and 18 all left room for Congress to make more subjective decisions that could result in the suppression of rights. Contrary to the arguments of Wilson and Hamilton, a Bill of Rights could do no harm as their function in state constitutions. It would serve a greater purpose for the Federalists, placating enough anti-Federalists to quiet a push for a second convention. While the addition of the Bill of Rights certainly did not fully satisfy anti-Federalists, it was still an important victory. It established some trust and created middle ground between the Federalists and anti-Federalists. also protected a number of individual liberties that the anti-Federalists feared would be exploited by the war clauses and the necessary and proper clause in Article 1, Section 8. However, the most ardent anti-Federalists saw the first 10 amendments as a loss because their most fundamental criticism involved structural issues with the Constitution, none of which were adequately addressed by the Bill of Rights. Madison, claiming himself to be a friend to what is attainable, managed to skirt the structural amendments that were proposed in the state conventions under the guise of what was actually accomplishable. In Patrick Henry's letters to anti-federalist congressman Richard Henry Lee, he claimed that if the Bill of Rights was added, it would be just enough to satisfy the people and keep them from supporting a second constitutional convention, where real changes to government could be made. He argued the proposed amendments were a shadow, and they would tend to injure rather than to serve the cause of liberty. Many proposed structural amendments from both the Massachusetts and Virginia ratifying conventions would have further appeased the anti-federalists and eased some of their fears, but had no chance of passing. Every generation faces current political problems, and therefore should always consider new amendments as a way to renew the social contract. One major concern we have is, it is, is how difficult it is to amend the Constitution. Under Article 5, proposed amendments require a double supermajority. Our proposal is an amendment to the amendment process to make it easier to alter the Constitution. Political scientist Akhil Mar suggests that new amendments would have to meet three requirements to have a chance of ratification. They would need to extend rights, not restrict them. They need to have been tried in the states, a nod to Justice Brandeis's theory of laboratories of democracy explained in New State Ice Kobe Lehman. And lastly, the most difficult to achieve, both political parties would need to agree. Well, there are major problems that need to be addressed by our generation of climate change. We believe we should consider amendments that are more likely to pass, individual liberty amendments. 
an amendment that provides a right to vote for all citizens over 18 years old, protects marriage of two consenting adults, or clearly defines a right to privacy could be accomplished under Amar's model. Despite case law that affirms all these rights to some extent, clear constitutional language would provide further protection. Thank you, and we are ready for your questions. Okay. Hey. Um if are the are the amendments you propose the things you're the most concerned about or the, is there a right you personally have already thought about that you're concerned about losing well i believe what i the 28th amendment should be is addressing issues like climate change as mentioned in the statement uh if we look to the court case juliana v us it uh, the defense establishes that uh, def, uh protecting of the environment is crucial because infringing upon the environment, uh, dis, uh, I guess, damages one's life, liberty, and property. While this case was dismissed, uh, we can see it established in the New York State Constitution where an amendment was added to it to protect the environment. And this uh, uh, complies to a Mars model where uh, amendments should be uh, tried in the states before added to the constitution. But I think that this is more likely to be passed in our constitution due to the polarization of political parties. We can see to the Green New Deal with a disagreement between political parties in terms of environmental protection. But if there were to be an individual liberty amendment uh, passed uh, in defense of the environment, it would be more unlikely, but a structural amendment in terms of the environment could be seen uh, mimicking the language seen in the war clauses, such as the two-year check on possible carbon emissions. But uh, that's a, an amendment that I feel very strongly should be passed within the Constitution, but would most likely be uh, disregarded due to the polarization of political parties. I feel like that amendment that should be passed is one we also mentioned in our statement, which is making the amendment process a little bit easier. I feel like we should take from our double supermajority of two thirds, every fifth, that would be six votes in the Senate and then 26 in the House. That would also have to be room for moving the states down. So from going from three fourths down to two thirds would be down five states. This would make it so uh, just a little bit easier to pass amendments. So many new amendments could be passed that were just barely missing it. Either they were made after the, they were ratified after the sunset clause or they were just a couple of votes short. And on that note, I think that that's where uh, the other three potential amendments that we mentioned come into play, whether that be privacy, voting, or marriage, is that all of them have been upheld in some way in court cases or previous amendments in uh, maybe more vague language, uh, language in the case of privacy under a penumbra of rights through this will be Connecticut. And I think that uh, by uh, making the amendment process slightly easier, these amendments have uh, a much greater potential to pass because they're not necessarily the most political amendments. They're a little more agreed upon than something like climate change. And that gives them a better chance uh, to succeed today. I'm curious, uh, in your list of, of uh, possible amendments, uh, you haven't talked about doing away with the Electoral College. Um, and that seems like a um, uh, it would increase the power of the national majority, right? Um, so talk to me a little bit about why you think this... Uh, this anti-majoritarian electoral college is, is a good thing, is something you want to keep. Well, I think that uh, one way to look at it is not necessarily that it's something to keep, but that it will be ratified in a way that isn't through an amendment. Uh, the national popular vote interstate compact uh, is a collection of states that have agreed once they reach uh, a certain capacity enough to win a, uh, a, a presidential election to vote in favor of the popular vote winner, uh, essentially uh, creating a popular vote uh, uh, system as opposed to the electoral college. And well, that brings up other questions. I think that it still applies that that hasn't occurred yet. And I think it uh, sort of uh, symbolizes some of the uh, hesitation in that kind of thing in the Electoral College because it can potentially give one political party uh, an advantage over the other. I think just the thought of that uh, causes problems. I so do you, we, go ahead. Do you, think it, do you think it's an issue that uh, you know, you're proposing a, an evasion of the constitution, right? I mean, so, I mean, how, how, does it, how does it work with constitutional protection of rights if we're just going to evade them? I think that uh, that's a, a concern. I think it's another reason why it hasn't happened yet is because I think there's an argument there that you can't just sort of work around the Constitution like that. But I think that as far as it's, a, it's sort of a practicality, I think that it is, I, the Electoral College is not uh, the most democratic way to vote for your president. It uh, gives certain states way more power here in Massachusetts our vote matters a lot less than in Ohio, for instance. Uh, and so I think that that's why it sort of sparked this debate uh, uh, today, despite its sort of questionability uh, uh, legally. 
Um, you're in the first Congress, 1789. I'm James Madison, and I've handed you a Bill of Rights. And what's in it is the Ninth Amendment and the Tenth Amendment. That's it. Uh, give me your votes. You for it or against it? Well, I'm going to pretend I'm an anti-federalist, and I'm going to say that I'm against it because the Tenth Amendment doesn't include the word expressly. And that's a major concern that the anti-federalists wanted within the Bill of Rights. And that word expressly was mimicked within state, uh, constitu uh, state constitutions like in Massachusetts and Virginia. And the state power that would have been allowed through that word expressly within the Bill of Rights would have had that structural push for the anti-federalist argument and would have allowed way more power given to the states. So as an anti-federalist, I, I would have supported that Bill of Rights if it had that language in it. And as an anti-federalist there as well, I would also be against uh, the Ninth and Tenth Amendments. And I think that the key to that is the, the lack of the word expressly because uh, the Bill of Rights wasn't necessarily their primary concern. And uh, leaving those implied powers was a much uh, sort of bigger uh, concern for them and to remove them would have been a much, uh, a much more satisfying to them, I think, in the end. I think you can see right away the debates over implied powers begin with the National Bank eventually in McCulloch v. Maryland uh, being set in the Supreme Court case with the word appropriate used as far as uh, the necessary and proper clause. I think that that alarms the anti-federalists or would have alarmed the anti-federalists as well. So I think that that's why the word expressly is so important is that it's not necessarily a part of the Bill of Rights as much as it almost addresses other anti-federalist concerns that would not have been addressed in a Bill of Rights. And so, I'll pretend I was, oh, I'll, there I'll, we go. We got the federalists, okay. right? <laughs> I'll pretend I'm, I'll be a federalist and I would say I'll let this go as long as there doesn't have to be a second convention. This was the main reason that the Bill of Rights the Bill of Rights got passed for, from the federal's point of view. They just didn't want a second convention. They liked the Constitution how it was. They just wanted to keep it. Thank you. <laughs> so you, you talked about reconsidering the social contract or reformulating the social contract. Um, would you go so far as to endorse Jefferson's idea that we should have a constitutional convention every 19 years? I, I wouldn't support that just because of the mass polarization of political parties. I feel like the disagreement that would have been faced in a reoccurring uh, constitutional convention would have just caused chaos. And I feel like it wouldn't have been the effective way to uh, create change. And I feel like through pro uh, the amendment process being a uh, deliberate and having changes be deliberate, uh, a convention every 19 years wouldn't be an effective form of government. Uh, I think you can also argue that it's just impractical to sort of uh, have a, a new constitutional convention every 19 years. I think that it leads to a lot of instability in government uh, over the course of sort of a, our constitution has been around for 234 years. That's a lot of constitutional conventions. And I think that it would create sort of a, it's, it's difficult to imagine uh, the relationship uh, internationally, even domestically, as far as uh, sort of changing the goalposts uh, every 19 years. I think it would create problems there. I feel like we could also look to Federalist 37, where Madison says that constitutional liquidation would be in play in the Constitution, so that as our time in the world went on, as the America's time in the world went on, there would be room to get new things like technology. Like, I don't think that anyone was thinking about cell phones back then because there weren't around. <laughs> So I feel like you know the, the issues uh, faced every 19 years, it would have been a very subjective to the generation that it was facing. And um, if we wanted to have a constitution that would be flexible and uh, persistent, uh, I feel like maybe 19 years would be a good amount of time for that flexibility. But the, the focus on the issues of that generation, I feel like would be highlighted and the the stability of the longevity of the constitution would be disregarded. Where do rights come from? And does it matter? Um, I feel like there are rights that we, uh, we can look to Scottish enlightenment where we're born with rights. We know not to kill or to uh, uh, steal like the, that's common sense, but also like the, the rights of our own life and people want to fringe upon them. So I feel like there are rights that we are born with and there are, and we have the right to not be infringed upon them. Uh, yeah, I don't know that. I, I agree. I think there's this idea of sort of fundamental rights, common sense rights that are sort of, uh, they're, they're undeniable, they're unalienable, uh, to use the words from our constitution. They're, they're sort of uh, impossible to uh, get rid of. And then in addition to that, you have rights that have developed more over time. And I think those include 
uh, rights that either were contemporary issues or are contemporary issues. When you look at things like uh, the right to uh, privacy as far as bodily autonomy, uh, the right to voting even, I think, is sort of um, things that have uh, come into uh, play more recently, or at least sort of been uh, uh, contested more recently, uh, is another way that uh, maybe isn't as sort of uh, objective or ancient, but still applies. So are the British, um, what's the British, uh, do Americans reject or accept common sense uh, tradition or, or how, how, do you, how do the American rights theory fit here? I think that it comes in a combination of both with this sort of uh, British idea of discovering rights, learning rights and learning where your rights, where your virtue comes from. Uh, it's a French uh, enlightened idea as well. Uh, people like Montesquieu and then in England, people like John Locke. But I also think that there's sort of this idea of, of, of a feeling of, of rights, a feeling of uh, what is good, of what is virtuous, and of what rights belong to you. Uh, and I think that that comes from uh, the Scottish Enlightenment as well as a French philosopher like Rousseau. Thank you. Thanks. We don't get too many groups who start out taking away my questions. <laughs> but, but your outline, your outline addressed some of the very things I had questions about, and I just I thought it was really excellent. Y'all know so much that you you couldn't get it out fast enough, and that was very admirable. Really was, gentlemen. Yeah, I I enjoyed your uh, uh, comments today. Um, I thought you did a nice job in the opening. Uh, remarks you you emphasized limited government, uh, which I think is is really the the critical detail here. Um, we could have talked a little bit more about you know majorities and, and majority tyranny and and just how that would uh, uh, would play into the question of uh, of rights um, because it does you know how we defend against government is partly how we defend against ourselves, right? So, um, you know, how we manage that, that translation is, um, is, I think, an interesting one. Uh, I'd love to talk to you more about contemporary politics and why you think it would be easier to get an amendment protecting uh, same-sex marriage than it would be to get an amendment uh, amending the Electoral College. Um, I just, I'm just not sure that... Uh, uh, the culture wars that we've been having would uh, would really lend themselves to uh, uh, protection of of marriage or abortion or or any of these other things. Um, so, um, but you know, you can come to Juniata College. We'll have four years to talk about it, and that'll be uh, that'll be plenty of time, right? So, again, I thank you very much. It was it was a pleasure to, uh, spending time with you this afternoon, um, and best of luck for today and the future. Yeah, you, you did some nice things here. I, I was, uh, you know, the fact that you know what's going on here between uh, Patrick Henry and his, uh, his senators uh, in the first Congress and, and they're back and forth on, on a second convention, uh, that demonstrates some, uh, some deeper reading than most. Uh, I also thought you're, uh, you know, you, you did something interesting and you held onto the uh, Amar framework and it served you well in the follow-ups. Uh, nope, that won't work because it violates Amar number three. Or nope, that won't work because they had been tried enough in the States. So I think that speaks to uh, an interesting approach. Create a framework, and you use that framework to think from. And that was noticeable in the follow-ups that uh, you carried through on that framework. And so I think that was a particularly interesting and notable feature of your presentation. I'm glad to know that you could uh, you could work with the Ninth and Tenth Amendment. Uh, I, I know that's kind of a stupid question, silly question, but uh, I appreciate you humoring me with uh, with your analysis, which I thought was uh, was spot on. And uh, my last, you know, this uh, Scottish and common sense tradition. Um, yeah, I would like I would like to spend more time on that, obviously, but uh, I think you got your chops in on that. So that's that was fantastic as well. So uh, thanks for spending time with us, and uh, I do I do appreciate your thoughts. Thank you. Thank you. All right, time for you guys to log off, and congratulations on a job well done, and um, have a good day. Thank you. Bye bye.